right. Good morning, everybody, and welcome. It's the Trade Chat. Don Kaufman here. It's a Friday. Yeah, by the way, I don't have my camera. I went up to the mountains and I forgot something. That was that was about it. But I, you know, I brought everything else. So a nice little setup up here. I like it. It's Don in the mountains. It's an unshaved animal. Oh, there's two and a half minutes to go to the cash open here on this Friday. The spoos are up 15 handles. Don's getting angry. Uh, 15 handles again after what? Uh, 28 handle run yesterday. You know, we're going to look at the uh, SPX and the expected move because that one really handicapped a huge amount of the price action that uh, we underwent yesterday. Um, <laughs> I wouldn't say I was missing the camera. <laughs> No, I have like a whole tripod and everything. It did not occur to me. It did not occur to me. Anyway, with uh, with that, so the spoos are up some 15 handles. You know, there is, uh, there's there's nothing going on. <laughs> there's not much volume out there. You know, interestingly enough, though, the bonds, they're still getting edgy. And if you look at the bonds, the bond volume, that's right. The bond volume is almost as much as what you're seeing in the S&Ps. So... Well, I think that the uh, the next move in this marketplace is defined by bonds, which uh, of course you would kind of expect because CPI is coming out next uh, next week. I can't believe this crap. We have to talk about like CPI again. Like really? <clears throat> yeah. By the way, I also forget. Yeah, no, I don't have any wife and kids up here either. Okay, it's a special mission I'm up here on, <laughs> getting away. So we're going to come into the cash open and uh, right now there's not a ton to look at. It's, you know, we're, we're picking up where we kind of left off yesterday. The advanced decline line will be relatively strong. Uh, we're not in full blown correlation kind of mode when it comes to some of the, uh, the big monsters of tech. There's bids under them, but it's generally speaking rather mild. It's a good size bid under NVIDIA, but there's like nothing on my screen that's like, you know, I'm pointing and oh, like, because look, Microsoft is unchanged. Apple in here is relatively unchanged. There's definitely the bid under NVIDIA. There's a little bit of a bid, you know, under Meta, but it's it's pretty negligible. So let's come to uh, the cash open here. The spoos are bid. That's it's what it is right now. Let's uh, check out ticks in the advanced decline line. So at the bell, advanced decline line, as I said, it's strong, but it's not. Uh, it's not in full-blown correlation kind of mode. Um, again, I'm kind of suspect of this, you know, the rally back to some degree. Google's actually off a little bit at the open. <clears throat> My fonts look all gigantic on this screen. My, what large fonts you have. Um, my screen like barely fits on here. I didn't feel like adjusting it. <laughs> I was going to mess with it. I only got up here kind of a little, little later last night. S&P is taking a little bit of a hit here at the open, but not much to read into. Look, you're on positive ticks. You're on a very strong advanced decline line. You know, trade like this. I'm going to just throw this out right after this bell just went off. Trade like this is frustrating. <clears throat> it's very frustrating to me. And it's not frustrating okay, for any other reason. You know, it's not about going up. It's just, it, it became again very quickly like that one sided market. And Don don't like no one sided marketplace. Um, <clears throat> I'm hoping okay, today that we at least adhere to some degree to the expected move, but look where we are right now. I mean, you know, come on, we're trading right now in like never, never land, which is well above the upper edge of that expected move. Like that is the trading session. That's it. You know, <clears throat> I mean, it's like, when I say that's the trading session, you know, I said this, on Monday, I said the whole week is going to come down to the upper edge of this expected move. And here we are on Friday and we're outside. And that's the lower probability. But that lower probability can be a very, very vicious move. And to kind of quantify that for a second, right, you can see 
the upper edge of the expected move is 5190. And now when I mention this, okay, the single most important aspect, okay, of kind of mentioning this, I realized I don't have my right on board either. Damn. Okay. Anyway, I, I gotta use my mouse for everything. Um yeah, I just packed up and got the hell out of there. <laughs> I had to I had to get out of the major city. It wasn't it's not working for me. 5190, okay was actually a critical, you know, that's the upper edge of the expected move. It was 5202, which is right in this neighborhood here at 5202, okay? That would have been the definitive break. Now that we're outside it, the one aspect, okay, that you have to be aware of is the slightest movement to the upside sparks a okay, trade to have to buy markets. And this, this is where lots of people come up with conjecture as to why the markets are moving. I am telling you, okay, this is not, you know, look, there's going to be news this morning. In fact, I'll even set an alarm for that, okay? There will be news this morning. The, uh, the news that's coming out is the uh, sentiment survey. So I'll set an alarm just to alert us. I'm going to tell you right now, if you have intraday trades on, you may not want to hold like, you know, just a, a runner or a position through the consumer sentiment survey. Like that could get all kinds of crazy. But as I was saying a moment ago, there's always conjecture as to why the market's moving. You know, that's, I guess, makes for good. It make for good TV, obviously, okay? We rip to the upper edge of the expected move earlier in the week, but everything you see thereafter, in fact, I'm going to bring this up on a, uh, let's go to a uh, time frame. Come on, time frame. Uh, we'll do, uh, well, let's bring up the whole week, five day, and we'll do a five minute, right? Five day, five minute, hit okay. There you go. <clears throat> so forgive the little blips in here. That's overnight trade. But in the SPX, right, here we are, okay, obviously there's Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. So coming out of, uh, coming out of course of last week, here we are on Monday, we rip out of the gate, we hit the expected move on Tuesday, which is basically that one's in the books, hit the expected move, you're just basically riding on it throughout the course of the week. Yesterday, we had our first real break to the upside. What this causes, right, is again, uh, what is often referenced as like a gamma squeeze, but people just don't really get what that means, right? Imagine that trading firms are often selling, selling, okay, boatloads of options, okay, in the expected move. They sell boatloads of options in the expected move. They often take that capital that they sell, okay, and they jam it into places like, well, NVIDIA. And NVIDIA is preeminent stock to talk about today because it is one of the primary drivers. And don't get ahead of yourself. We're up 0.3% in this marketplace. NVIDIA, though, is pretty critical. So they sell tons of premium to finance another trade. Now, all of that premium selling, think of it as a big, big ball of risk, okay? And that ball rolls right, okay, to the average, right, of the premium sold. When I say the average of the premium sold, this week, the average of the premium sold, okay, would have been about 62 bucks. That was its expected move. That's the average of the premium sold. The second that you get outside, okay, by more than a few points, we take off and we accelerate because the ball of risk has to be mitigated, has to be mitigated. <clears throat> and this is not, you know, as somebody just said, it's a favorite indicator. I don't consider expected move. Like, I, again, people can call it an indicator. You can call it anything you want. I don't really consider it an indicator. It's just knowing where that ball of risk happens to be. It's the only thing that, that matters in, you know, index trading. You know, some stocks are going to move. They're going to do their thing, okay? But the index product is, uh, it's what drives order flow. It's, it is what drives order flow. So you have this ball of risk, 
that all of a sudden now has to roll up the hill. And what people don't get is market making firms, they have to buy. Okay. What are they buying? They're buying S&P futures. Now, if you buy then why do you have to buy? Okay. Because they don't want to lose, right? Let's say that this line right here is your break-even point. And I'm trying to come up with different, uh, different ways to, uh, to display this. But let's say that this line is your break-even point. For many trading firms, it really is kind of close to the break-even point. So the second that you come through the break-even point, they have to take an active stance okay, to mitigate risk. An active stance to mitigate risk would imply, all right, if you are short deltas, so let's say the market making firm, the dealer is short delta, okay? So I'm going to put this as the MM, that's the market maker is short delta. How do we know they're short delta? Because they sell crap. If this is where the week starts, okay, up here, they're selling calls, down here, okay? They're selling puts. So the second that we start to go up, <clears throat> they become more and more short delta. When we start to actually cross through this line, all right, they have to actively hedge that. I mean, very actively hedge it. And to hedge it, they add positive delta. Why? To kind of zero out their directional occurrence of risk. Positive delta is found by buying S&P futures. Okay, this is what these squeezes are about nothing more, nothing less. And again, there's so much conjecture on this crap. <clears throat> now, the interesting thing is if you get kind of far outside of the expected moves, go back to a one day, one minute. But if you get kind of far outside of the expected move, what can happen is imagine they have all this negative delta and you get negative delta having sold calls. Okay. Once those calls are fairly deep in the money, you never know where this is. <clears throat> but once these calls are ITM in the money to the tune of approximately okay, a one delta, one delta basically means is that would be almost the same as stock, right? Okay. So all of a sudden, they're negative one delta. And you go, well, where the hell did you get the negative one delta? Negative one delta doesn't matter what the product is delta is delta is delta but in this in this case in the spx if they're <clears throat> if they're negative all right delta out there if they're negative one delta it's much easier to hedge with positive one delta and what you basically get is the <clears throat> delta of the options is no longer what we term soft it's malleable at that point Okay, or I should say the delta is malleable up until the point where it actually becomes, you know, static of a negative one delta. And the hedging then can cease to exist. Now, this is kind of the crap that I, mean, I don't think about every day, and I definitely don't talk about it every day. But as we start to blow through the upper edge of an expected move like this, okay, we're probably fairly close to it because, you know, 5190, where are we? We're, you know, 46 handles outside of that. At some point over here, the options that they've hedged, okay, it's basically like a one for one. They're negative one hedging with a positive one. And at that point, it becomes like a lock. They don't have to continue to hedge anymore. So what can happen is we can come up, we can come up, and then all of a sudden we'll drift. And if we come down very, very slightly, then they have to turn around okay, and rip the hedges off. We can come right back down to the expected move. That's the only thing that you'd really be looking for today. You know, and again, when I say there's all this conjecture, you know, <clears throat> on the buy side, who else is on the buy side besides market makers? Okay. Um, there's a lot of buybacks. There's no question. There's stock buybacks always going on. And with stock, stock buybacks going on, stock buybacks, like an Apple, for example, they're going to buy back $110 billion of the stock which is larger than 418 companies inside of the S&P 500. But in a stock buyback situation, uh, even if it's you know 5% of the volume, imagine you have all these firms in here, okay? But 
Apple themselves are constantly on the bid. It definitely produces, you know, positive momentum. There's no question about that. Okay. But it's probably not enough to really warrant being looked at. You know, uh, the stuff that I would look at is much more along the lines of like NVIDIA. Because NVIDIA, you know, we're 12 minutes into the day and NVIDIA is already ripping up about 2.3%. Speaking of NVIDIA, you know, look, if the same thing works, why not keep going at it? There's call buyers in here in a heavy way. Okay, big call buying going on inside of NVIDIA. Okay, and if <clears throat> like you're not seeing it in any of the other real big tech stocks here, and Microsoft's up a little bit, but NVIDIA, okay, is the marketplace right now. What else you got? Eh, a little bit of financials, no question about it. Financials and energy came on pretty good yesterday. Uh, the financials, another strong bid under here. By the way, to me, to me, this is the most surprising sector. It really is because the hell wants to buy it. What's going on good in the financial sector right now? Higher for longer, okay? Higher for longer, more free money, free money for the financials, okay? Nevertheless, eventually they're going to have to... And they're talking about loan loss provisions there for, uh, you know, commercial real estate. Nevertheless, if you're taking a look right now at the S&Ps, which are basically sitting at highs right now, okay, ticks, kind of a moot point. Ticks have actually flattened out. And you notice I haven't gone to the advanced decline line much, but the advanced decline line really is picking up quite nicely. You're almost in full-blown correlation mode. So <clears throat> the next question that people will ask on this front, okay, um, by the way, Mark was saying, what do they do with the negative delta, okay, um, of those in the money options? Well, you hedge negative delta with a pure positive delta. And it's just easier when it's negative delta because, well, I shouldn't say negative delta. I should say when it's a full negative one delta, it's easy to hedge, right? But when, again, when you're at a full negative one delta, okay, you just add basically a positive one delta. And when you hit a negative one delta, the delta just goes, boo, it flatlines, like it can't increase anymore. So it maximizes. And the way that I think I should describe this, let's take it to the spiders for a second, because we're very close to what I would say would be the stall. Okay. Take a look at these options in spiders and take a look at them now with delta. Okay. Why? All right. We only have uh, 14 strikes. Let's actually go to 20 strikes. So not 120 a monkey, 20, there you go. All right, so take a look at the deltas. I'm gonna close up this left side bar because I want you to get a really good look at this, All right? So let's say that you sold calls. These are calls right here, those are calls. Let's say you sold some calls. And if you sold these calls earlier in the week, they've gone in the money. Well, they don't have to go that deep in the money, okay, to basically have a one delta. So what happens is if they're, if you're deep in the money, like right here, that is, and you've sold it, that's a negative one Delta. So how do you hedge negative one Delta by buying stock? Okay. And all of these deltas right to about this 95 Delta. Okay. <clears throat> those are pretty much static at this point. They're going to end up in the money. So that crap is easier to hedge. And, and it basically, once you've hedged a negative one Delta, it's over. Like, how do you hedge negative one by adding positive one? Okay, boom, done. They ain't got to hedge no more. Now, if the market keeps going up, okay, it doesn't matter. They already equal zero. And that's not going to change because the delta on these is static, meaning it's, it's constant, okay? Whereas if you were looking right now and having to hedge, if you had to hedge like at the money stuff, that's malleable. That's what we call a soft delta. That's Mr. Toad's wild ride, especially today. Why is the delta so wild? Because today is expiration, which actually brings the gamma. Okay, What's gamma? Gamma is the rate of change of delta. Why the hell do I care? Because if you have a high gamma, it's hard to actually control delta. Are we good? It's good stuff. It's good stuff, right? So when you think about this, there's, <clears throat> there's nothing in here all right, that's like, you know, fascinating or anything. It's just a matter of crap goes in the money. And when crap goes in the money, okay, there's less hedging, okay? There's less hedging activity. And if there's less hedging activity, what can happen is the market will rip and it'll stall at some point. And then it can start to come back down, right? Does it have to come back down? Absolutely not. I mean, 
again, you're about to see news come out in about 15 minutes. But I thought that this was, I don't know, something different, something kind of cool to explain. Because uh, you'll see this kind of week in and week out. Now, you will see, okay, you will see explosive moves above expected move. But this is a perfect one to, like, you know, show you it, it came up stalled and came back in a little bit but it doesn't mean like we have to come all the way back to the expected move it does not mean that but on the flip side it doesn't take much to come back to this 5190 that would be a big move though today i'm not going to deny that like you're trading basically 5240 you got to come back down what yeah that's 50 handles okay now something i said last weekend that should resonate with you i looked at the expected move last weekend and i'm like you're nuts $62 expected move, right? $62 expected move. Where are we right now? Well, we started basically at the 25 level and uh, yada, 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 okay? You know, you're a hundred plus, uh, what? Oh, you're 110, 112 points. So not 62, okay? About 110. You're almost, you're almost at a two standard deviation move. That's significant, okay? So even though people are looking at VIX and they're going, oh, VIX sucks. Yeah, but we're outstripping the moves dramatically. Like if you looked into next week, or I'm already looking forward to next week, okay? There's a $72 expected move. I'm sorry, there's CPI next week. We could move 72 bucks in two minutes. These numbers, like... People that sell short dated options right now, okay, are out of their minds. And people, go, well, I just sell puts. Well, you just sell puts because that's directional and the market goes up. That's being right. That doesn't mean, though, by selling puts, you ain't got edge. Never confuse directional bias being correct with edge in a marketplace because you sold puts and made money. Well, that's because we went up, right? But selling premium in the short duration, okay, not only doesn't it have edge for retail, this would actually be negative. Meaning when I say negative, I mean, it's a negative expected outcome, right? There's one that you don't hear too often. What's a negative expected outcome? It means basically if you did something like a thousand times, okay, you will lose money. I will lose money. If I do this a thousand times, do what? Like selling zero DTE. Buying zero DTE can be quite readily profitable. Profitable. It can be really profitable actually uh, on the buy side, but on the sell side, now there's too many market making firms in here. You know, one thing, I know it's a weird way to think of the marketplace, but we're going to look at volume for a second versus open interest. Check this out. I know this is a really weird thing, but See right there is like 10,000 already traded. I know we're in the SPX. SPX, the mother of all products. But you know, here, let's do it some justice. Let's go to a retail friendly product. Let's go to the spiders. Let's let's do this. So we go over to the spiders and we're looking right now. Okay, look at this. Like 50,000 of this crap, 68,000, 69,000 have already traded today. Like look at the size, the volume. The volume way outstrips the open interest. So what do you know about this? Okay, all right, what is this? What is this? Okay. Who's trading all these contract size? You're like, it's me, man. It's me. Okay. I'm the one trading it. It's market making firms, it's proprietary trading firms, everybody. So there's one thing that I'll tell you though, especially about selling premium. You don't necessarily want to hop on and sell premium where everybody else is selling premium. Okay. I'm just not like this is too efficient. It's too efficient. Okay, there's a reason when we talk about like selling premium, whether it's an Ultima, whether it's in Catapult, whatever, there's a reason we're out here. Okay, there's a reason we're, we're out 100 and you know something days, a lot more volatility out there. Okay, and there's edge, there's edge, and this it's not a perceived edge, it's an actual edge in markets. Speaking of markets, okay, they are running. So, reminder in eight minutes, you're going to get data. Okay, data in eight minutes. Anyway, the uh, S&Ps continue to kind of rip up here a little bit. The data is going to, ah, it's going to make us a little crazy over here. Not that I'm not crazy enough. Speaking of which, so I'm up in the uh, in the mountains right now. I am in Payson, Arizona. Okay. 
I'm only on three computer monitors. You don't know what it's like having to trade on just three monitors and not six. <laughs> Does that sound terrible? As I was telling people, I forgot my camera, but I also forgot my little right on board. Like everything I do is very deliberate today because I don't have the wild right on board. Okay. I, I thought I had everything up here. I really did. I thought I had everything up here. I must have uh, removed it. I don't really have a house right now other than this and the island. <laughs> my homeless, my homeless in there. Okay. We're still in a rental house. So we officially begin rebuilding our house next week. Oh, the excitement. I don't think I told this story yet, but for those of you that do not know, uh, I have said that back in January, January 5th, my wife returned home from the Virgin Islands, uh, returned to the home here in Arizona because the kids go to school in Arizona, but we live in the Virgin Islands. Why don't the kids go to school in the Virgin Islands? Because the schools suck in the Virgin Islands. Sorry. I'm sorry, Virgin Islands. I'm sorry. Schools suck there, at least according to my wife. So she put it back in school here in Arizona. So anyway, they come back in Arizona and she gets home at two o'clock in the morning and the house is flooded. Uh, we lost about 4,000 square feet of the uh, of the main structure of the house under about, oh, only about an inch, inch and a half of water throughout the course of the house. Um, <clears throat> anyway, we've had to live in a rental ever since because uh, the kids are still in school. The kids get out of school though in like a week and then we're gonna go back to the island. Uh, nevertheless, Okay. The entire last five months, the insurance company has been sending investigators out uh, and have paid absolutely nothing. So we uh, we have to rebuild the house uh, out of pocket. They're, they're finally going to give something to us, but it's insane. It's absolutely insane. We have uh, uh, about a million, million and a half dollars worth of damage. And uh, the insurance is uh, useless, absolutely useless. Right now, they are... Uh, they're offering uh, about two hundred thousand dollars, which couldn't even replace the floors in there. So it's been a uh, it's been a trying time. I have to rebuild a house. Okay, I mean we're back down to like architect. I had to deal with an electrical engineer. Okay, a structural engineer. These are not fun people. Okay, they are not fun people. Anyway, um, we're waiting for this data to come out over here. Um, I like what Tim said. They're going to cancel you too. Actually, there's a law about that. They're they're not allowed to cancel me just yet. They're going to wait. They're going to wait a little while before they cancel me, but uh, it's upsetting because you pay insurance. Like I've paid insurance since I'm 23 years old on homes. I've, I owned a home when I was 23 and I've never, ever filed a claim, nothing. Okay. And I've actually had like a, you know, leaks and roofs and stuff. Never filed a claim. First time I actually filed a claim in Needham. Okay. They bailed, they bailed on me. Um, but we have the right people working on it. Here we go. That is not what the alarm was supposed to be set for. Apparently, Don is uh, incapable of setting an alarm properly. I set that alarm. I put a nine in there, man. I got video on it, okay? I could have been somebody. Um, yeah. <clears throat> oh, yeah, where did the water come from? So here's the best part. I'm a tech geek. I have water mitigation devices all over that house. I have water mitigation devices all over all of our houses. So. There was a small capillary tube behind a dishwasher that ran to a uh, ran to a refrigerator, like for an ice maker, and the capillary tube ruptured. But the capillary tube is very, very small, and it was under fairly high pressure. So when it ruptured, it sprayed it sprayed the outlet, which tripped the GFCI. Which, for those of you that are not technical, it, uh, it knocked the outlets off, which actually turned off my water mitigation devices. So I knew something was wrong. And I'm like looking all around because we have cameras in the house. I was looking all around. It was actually on Christmas day, uh, looking around, trying to find what was wrong. But who would think to look like at the floor, you couldn't see the water. I looked back at all the video footage. You couldn't see the water until like maybe three days in because it was so flat, clear, just couldn't see it. Um, we noticed though that like a rug looked really dark. It was, uh, it was really upsetting though. Uh, cause my wife, like, you know, just set up that house. That one's hers. I'm an Island boy. Okay. That house, she can have it. She can have it. Yeah. Um, anyway, so, uh, that's, yeah, it's, it's good stuff over there. Um, <clears throat> yeah. When, uh, when they finally do, you know, get beaten up and pay the claim, maybe then I'll mention which insurance company not to go to. <laughs> let's not bash them though live just yet. Okay. 
We'll wait until after they settle. Um, yeah, it sucks. I don't like having to bring an attorney in on anything. No. All right, so uh, s and is right now waiting for news. So we're going to wait for some news while we're actually waiting for that. Uh, a few trades that I do want to mention. And again, the s and is here, look, there's going to be absolutely, this is actually really cool. We're going to go through some trades here in a moment. Um, <clears throat> so, Geico, okay? It's an expensive home. The, um, the volume is con completely gone right now. So that's a little bit of a warning shot being fired. You want to see something else really interesting for those of you that understand depth of market? You cruise over here on Thinkorswim to Active Trader. By the way, there's a lot to talk about uh, with Thinkorswim too. There's no depth of market right now. This is NQ, but let's go to the ES. There's going to be no depth of market in here. Okay. What I mean by that is, you know, hundreds, actually, this is, this is not bad. You're going to see though, in the next two minutes, all of this size in here, this is what we call size or depth of market. And if you don't have this, don't worry about it. This crap can't help you anymore. You're like, you know, there's 200 here. There's 200 here. These are contracts that are on the bid and on the offer. Okay. Those, and those are real numbers because the CME is a first in first out market. All right. So I just buy one. Sorry about that. Okay. Anyway, do I have this thing turned on or off? Oh, auto send is not on. We're good. Anyway, the depth of market will disappear because everyone's afraid when these announcements come out, even market making firms, they're scared because you can go boom up really quick and you can fill 125 in a second like, well, fraction of second. So where we just saw 200 contracts up on both sides of it, <clears throat> there's the alarm. When you see 200 contracts up on both sides, the volume is going to disappear from either side of this. Look at it. It's thinning out right now. You know, there'll be some volume back here and here. There'll be some size shown back here, but they all disappear very, very quickly. Okay. And they do that because it's like literally like, you know, little turtle pulls his head back into the shell right before what could move markets. Now, this is ridiculous because we're talking about a University of Michigan consumer sentiment survey. This is a bunch of like wasted kids that walk around. And they go, what you think about the economy? Okay. <clears throat> In between protesting on campus, they walk around asking people what they think about the economy. And, uh, and yes, you know, it's a bunch of wasted kids. It's like graduation time over there. Anyway, the volume is gone and that's about to come raging back right now. So uh, we're uh, off to the races, you know, I, and again, I don't really care what the number is. I am very much like the purist. I like to look at the activity of trade. Like it doesn't matter to me what the survey said. It matters to me what the implications are, okay, to the products around us. And that's why I say, like, I, I've, you know, the longer I've been in this business, the more and more I've become like that. When I call it like a, you know, it's like a purist, like I just like, oh, I must, I must know what it is. Yeah, you can look at it. But, you know, by the time you look at it, and the point I'm trying to make with this, by the time you look at it, all right, um, what is it? <clears throat> Oh man, that's horrifically bad. Consumer is dead, man. So should the market go up or down? That's a damn good question about that, okay? Um, it's really, really bad news, really bad. This is probably one of the biggest, now I'm just saying this off the cuff. That's one of the biggest misses I have ever seen, okay, in any recent data. That's basically like the consumer Okay, just rolled over and died. And you would think like, that's it, baby. Now they're definitely going to cut rates. Maybe. Okay. But this is so bad. Like at some point, and this, this is actually what I'm going to talk about on the weekend video. So I'm totally screwing my whole weekend video here. But what I was going to talk about on the weekend video, bad's going to become bad very soon. I've been looking for that for a long time, but now bad has to become bad. Okay. Why does bad have to become bad? Because some companies are starting to forecast that things are not going to look so good. Unless you're, of course, Taiwan Semiconductor. Taiwan Semiconductor is actually the express reason that markets are a little bit higher. 
today. All right, Taiwan Semiconductor came out with some good uh, good news in here. Anyway, it's really interesting though to see this because uh, I wouldn't say they're, I mean, we're right back to the opening rotation in here, but look at the size that traded. Told you, the little, little turtle putting his head back out right now, okay? And if we go back over here to the active trader, look, look at the size of, we've all come back. We can all get along now, but we might not be at that point yet where bad news is bad news. The point that, that I'm trying to make with bad news is bad news and good news is bad news. And okay, look, the idea that bad economic data, bad economic data rallies markets, okay? It's ridiculous when you think about it because the only reason that this is occurring, and this is where Brandon Chapman does a phenomenal job of explaining it. Brandon was actually on this morning with uh, with Blake Young. By the way, we, we did away with the Wednesday afternoon chats. Okay, We've been experimenting with a Friday morning chat, if you guys were not aware of that. Okay, so Friday morning before the open. Friday morning now before the open is kind of the new Wednesday chat. And it's cool. Like, I like it. I like it because I, I'm going to just be honest with you. By Wednesday afternoon, most of our people, they're just, we're fried. You're fried even by Wednesday afternoon. You know, it's the days, the days are long. It's hard to do it after the open, but I kind of liked the idea of uh, before the market open. Anyway, the uh, the fact of the matter is, Okay, so so we're gonna do we're gonna continue with that Friday morning show, and it's Brandon and Blake uh, each Friday morning that will be on over there. Okay, um, cool. I I like that. That's some good feedback over there. Okay, um, yeah, Dimitri, we have tons of more emails coming out. We actually hired an entire crew for uh, each individual, like myself. Okay, and then Gianni. Okay, and Blake and Brandon. Everybody will have okay their own writer. So whatever we're looking at, okay, we have somebody that's actually putting that into emails and sending it out now. Uh, so we're definitely proliferating uh, more more emails because we've been people have been asking for that for years. Hey, this is you know what am I looking at today? What is what is Blake? What is Gianni? And we're like you know, individualized emails from those, you know, people. So like, you know, this morning, for example, you know, I have somebody that listens to everything that I do. Okay. And then we, you know, write a couple of different emails on it, write um, a couple articles on it. It's great. And we'll be able to segment that in the future too. So uh, S and P's right now after coming off, I mean, this is a pretty mild, you know, Oh, it's coming down. Okay, I would I would look more at the bond market in here than anything. So what I was saying about good data and bad data is it, it makes logical sense because if data like CPI comes out and it's hot, or if for example, you know, like retail sales uh you know sucks, the implications are that they're going to lower rates. But then when you start thinking about this kind of logically, the the thing is, <laughs> listening to me day to day is definitely not my wife, Tim. Anyway, um, sorry, I, I got to stop reading chat. Okay. Yeah. We're trying to like really beef things up right now on, uh, on some of the email front and so forth. Uh, there's a couple of things you're going to see coming. So we, uh, it's the summer of George. Anyway, with economic data, when bad is good and good is bad, when you step back from it and you start looking at it and you try to be really objective, we're talking about headline economic data is bad, okay? And if the data is bad, the market like looks at it and rallies is a distortion of the Fed because it implies that rates are gonna be lower. But at some point in here, okay, if you're a company and you say like, you know, if you're Apple and you're like, no, my, my China sales suck, by the way, the Chinese sales sucked and then they beat the estimate, right? But if they're, if you're China and you say you're, you know, oh, you know, uh, the economy is getting bad, so we're going to juice the economy. That's what China would say. But if you're Apple and your Chinese sales are bad, the stock actually goes down. At some point, okay, at some point, you have, you know, for instance, 
and I'm gonna give you a good example in this. Apple going down, okay? China rallying. Why is China rallying? China's rallying because they're juicing the markets there with everything they got. At some point, you hit an inflection point and you roll over, okay? Where companies that are having bad numbers start to overtake, right? Ultimately, this idea of that the Fed's going to cut. Remember, the Fed cuts when the economy starts to suck. So if the economy starts to suck, can you have asset prices at all time high? And this has been my this has been my logic for a long period of time. Okay. Meanwhile, we're sitting at all time highs. I, I know it's not the all, whatever. I don't care. It's all time highs. So you're sitting at an all time high. Okay with bad economic data coming out around us. But you're sitting at that high because no longer making money matters. All that matters is cheap money. And when does that notion kind of come apart is the big question, because that's when the proverbial crap is going to hit the fan, where that's when the Fed will actually step in and try to save markets. But you don't save a market that's at an all-time high. I'm also a firm believer that you cannot, like even if the CPI print comes out soft, a lot of people are talking about CPI. It's going to come out soft. It's going to come out soft. Okay. Maybe. Okay. I, again, I, I agree with Blake and, uh, you know, uh, and Brandon energy prices have come down a little bit. All right. There's, there's a few things that are maybe coming. So maybe CPI does come in soft next week. Okay. I'm not entirely sure how the order flow is going to play out because if CPI comes in soft, maybe this rally was because CPI is going to come in soft. You know, that's the point that I'm trying to also make with this is, okay, if you're a data-driven person and you're trying to sit here and like contemplate, well, like for instance, the, the University of Michigan sentiment survey just came out. The numbers, they weren't bad. They were horrific. You just saw them. They were absolutely terrifyingly horrific. Basically, the consumer is off the side of a cliff right now. Great. Markets rally. Take a look at something like, isn't Amazon very consumer driven? Sure, but they have a cloud business. Okay. Wouldn't something like Costco be impacted by a really bad consumer sur like sentiment survey? Okay. Survey says, didn't move at all on it. Okay. Not Walmart, not, not nothing. Not nothing in here. Okay. There's this critical detachment going on, which makes a lot of sense because trade these days is actually driven more by like order flow. Trade is literally driven more by order flow and uh, than it is what you think of like, you know, economic conditions and so forth. So it makes a lot of sense, but sooner or later, you know, things will show up from economy into the market. And there should be at this point, in my opinion, some fear, a little bit of loathing. Um, again, I don't put any weight at all into the consumer sentiment, uh, sentiment survey. Where I start putting weight though, is some of the projections, like more, more than anything, like I know it sounds ridiculous, like the Starbucks, that was bad. That was really bad. And the week that Starbucks, all the restaurants are coming out right now, okay? And having some issues. Um, I was bringing up like Cheesecake Factory, okay? This one actually had a bid under it, which, They've been maintaining and kind of holding their own. But I look at stuff like this. It's actually, you know, Jeff Bierman. And I'm actually going to bring Jeff on a little bit early this morning. It's Jeff Bierman that actually got me looking at this stuff years ago. You know, like looking at the consumer. The consumer basically is the economy. Then you have to pay attention. The one thing, though, and probably, okay, something I should, you know, bring up here is that the consumer obviously impacts Apple, Amazon, Google, but tech won't feel it until it's too late. Tech though, when it feels it, will be violent inside of the S&Ps. Speaking of the S&Ps, and again, I'm, I'm going out to some, some kind of esoteric stuff today, okay? Um, you know, it was really nice this morning. My commute, my commute this morning was walking upstairs to my office. Uh, I've been working out of uh, out of our uh, Scottsdale uh, guest house for years. Like I, you know, I go back and forth, but I work out of the guest house. But I have to live in a rental. It's like two miles away from it. Getting in a car in the morning, commuting to work is horrible. I don't know how you do it. 
Okay. My parents used to commute an hour and a half each way to work. We lived in Los Angeles for seven years and they used to commute an hour and a half each way to work. Um, I've had conversations with them recently about that. I'm like, you know, cause they used to get up, you know, leave the house by about, uh, oh, five 30, six in the morning. And they work together. Can you imagine that Okay, married for like 50 years working together. No, holy crap. And my mom used to just basically lock my dad in the, uh, in the office, <laughs> lock him in there. Do not come out until the end of the day. It's better for you. But uh, yeah, an hour and a half. The worst part of it was, it was the, uh, for those of you who know Los Angeles, it was the 110 to the 405. So the Harbor Freeway to the 405, that's a lovely little interchange. But I do remember coming home from like, uh, like high school. I'm like, no mom, no dad. And uh, sometimes, you know, if there was like an accident or something on the freeways, if you get stuck in the 405, they get home at like seven o'clock at night. <laughs> I was, I was a latchkey kid. I was like 15 at that point and enjoyed it, but I was a latchkey kid. Okay. Um, oh yeah. I just, I commuted also when I was in Chicago, the first year I was in Chicago, I was commuting. Um, and we were all the way out in like the Glencoe area. And that's, I learned all about the, you know, the L. Okay. The L is like, pretty horrible i mean i'm just i'm not like i mean it's better than like a new york subway though apparently at this point by the way the greatest subway system in the world if you guys have never been there i would have to say is probably singapore okay not only did i take the subways in singapore like i wanted to take the subway in singapore this is a germaphobe that wanted to go into the subway I took the subway everywhere it's freaking awesome all right people there are so helpful too not 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 like you in new york no no not going back to New York. I haven't been to Chicago since 2019. And uh, I was just talking to Tom Sosnoff the other day about that too. I haven't, I haven't been to Chicago in a long, long time. And uh, I'm going to keep it that way. <laughs> I've decided that's it, baby. I'm out. Okay. I'll come back here to Arizona. That's enough of humans. I'll go back to the island a little bit. But right now I'm up in the mountains. There's no humans up here. I had an elk scare the living hell out of me though yesterday. I walked out the front door go throw the garbage out it's like the third or fourth time that's happened okay and there was an elk but i haven't been up here and spent much time up here so uh i was not uh yeah was not prepared for a uh, gigantic elk to be in front of me so uh i i almost uh i almost wet myself <laughs> let's just put it what it is i uh, i almost wet myself over there okay oh yeah japan has good uh yeah singapore singapore is worth going to okay Good food, expensive, but Singapore is definitely worth uh, worth going to. So if you guys don't mind, I'm actually, uh, I'm going to bring on the professor. I'm going to bring on Jeff Beerman right now. So uh, yeah, Jeff's going to come in here live, okay? Live and uncut, we will have the professor, Jeff Beerman. I'm driving though, Jeff. I'm just letting you know now, man. I am driving. So, uh, okay, I'm an excellent, I'm an excellent driver. An excellent driver. I'm going to make Jeff the co-host over here. So the professor is live. Oh, you have a camera set up too? Eh, sorry about that, man. I forgot the camera in the mountains. You know, So uh, we get to see you. You're green, man. You're green. Oh, there you go. <laughs> you can... You can talk. It's okay. I'm, I mean... You know what? I have, your, yeah. your wife must really love you because you're a control freak. <laughs> um, that is why we have multiple homes. So when I am sent to my, you know, area, okay, I work in an office and uh, I'm not allowed back in the house. I have coffee machines. I'm good. Okay. Actually, you know, you'd be surprised, Jeff. I uh, marry now about 15 years. I know kind of what I can do and what I can't do. And uh, yeah, I, I think I, I lost control about 10 years ago. <laughs> somewhere, <laughs> somewhere along the lines, I have completely you know, succumb to losing, uh, losing control to her about that. Speaking of which, Ooh, it's mother's day. I'm going to have to go back on Saturday, mother's day this weekend, get stuff people. Yeah. 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 My daughter, my daughter comes to me because where are we going for mother's day? I go, haven't had thought about it at all. <laughs> I'm going to have a, a house full of people. Okay. The mother, the mother comes to me and then <sighs> the, uh, ah, my sister's coming over. It's, it's, that's, yeah. Okay. It's, that's, you know what? I don't often drink anymore, but, uh, I'm going to make it. Might exception. start drinking again. Got to get some of that Kirkland at Costco. Oh, I'm not against it. I just don't drink very often, but I'm going to make an exception for, uh, you know, 
my uh, the wife and the sister in the uh, in the same room at the same time. That'll drive uh, that'll drive me to do it. What uh, what are we looking at this morning? So I mean, like the order flow is not too like astounding. But did you take a look at the uh, University of Michigan sentiment survey? I don't listen to that crap. It's all it's it's like they asked like these like five hundred deadheads who have no concept of how life works and ask them, how do you feel about the future? <laughs> They're so stoned and drunk from last night. Like, why waste your time? My yeah. wife went to that college. <laughs> yeah. So uh, actually, I actually have a lot of friends that went to uh, University of Michigan, although more friends that went to uh, Michigan State. Okay. And it's it's actually, now that's a good party. You get the two of them together, you know, for some football. That's, uh, that's a good time. Oh, that's, that's, that's a rivalry, man. Yeah. That is. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So uh, S and P's at this point are still outside that expected move. Like the one thing I'm looking for here is so we're rolling over a little bit right now, but there's no there's no size, there's no punch to the downside. Yeah. Um, tech is wavering, but you're still being held together by Nvidia. But Nvidia seeing some sell side. Let's go look at its order flow real quick. Yeah, by the way, let, let me let me pitch this to be pitch this to be yeah. frame before Don. News came out this morning on three different sites I checked. This is the lowest level of short interest in over three years. Did you know that? You know what? Uh, Jeff Roth, the uh, the other founder here at uh, Theo, said that to me last night. And it's funny because I was like, that, that can't be. And I'm like looking around. So that's done from like trade blotters, which uh -huh. right. I know I know you know this, but I don't know if like yeah. everybody realizes this. A trade blotter is often i think they report in every two weeks now but it's often like people look at like uh you know there's websites out there it's like shortinterest.com it's this it's that but those trade blotters are often rather depreciated um it's not it's i mean it's still somewhat viable but it's depreciated in terms of time but that's interesting because if we go down there's no one to support a bid at that point People look at shorts very wrong. Like I, uh, I'm not an Elon Musk fanboy. I actually like him now more than than I did like years ago. Uh -huh. um, but one thing that always pisses me off to no end about Elon Musk because he hates short selling. He thinks short selling should be like forever banned. And really? people they don't understand the dynamic of the marketplace. Um, I will never forget. I mean, I know you were there, but I will never forget when they banned short selling in financial stocks during the financial crisis, um, the absolute proverbial crap hit the fan because it caused a knee jerk reactions for the shorts to have to cover. So we exploded higher. Right. Right. But then when the market started coming back down, there was nothing to support it. There was nothing like could support the marketplace because why would anybody buy? It was a friggin' financial crisis. And <clears throat> as we were slipping lower, if we had allowed shorts, okay, it would have supported a bid under the marketplace. Because at some point, like if you're coming down, and it's kind of cool to think about this, but you know, you're coming down, you're coming down in a marketplace like this. If you're short, eventually you cover and you bounce. We were not getting any bounces. The next bounce, like after they did that ban short covering, the next bounce wasn't to like, November like 18th or something like that. And that crap started like in early October. All hell broke loose when they uh, they banned the shorts. So I'm not an advocate. By the way, there's no uptick rule anymore. And when people talk about short interest, they're referencing like, you know, be referencing the Qs, be referencing the spiders. It doesn't work the same in the S&P futures. The whole world could be short S&P futures. It's like, you know, because it's a contract, there's one buyer, one seller at all times. So it doesn't really work the same. Um, but nevertheless, there's clearly shorts are not per se in the market. Maybe they covered here and that's why we rallied higher. Now there's no shorts left. So is it time to re-up the shorts? Could, could be. Could be. Could be. Yeah, but quite possibly. What, are, what else are you looking at this morning? Yeah, uh, that Apple commercial uh, got 50 million views when it was released, and it was complete gaff. Apple released an apology today. It was like a dystopian commercial. They were crushing a million like toys and tools and like you know paints and everything that can go inside creation of an iPod. 
And I want your take on this Apple gap and why are people in love with Apple when they have virtually no growth and they have 30% loss of market share in China? There's a couple of couple of reasons. Number one, Warren Buffett owns it. I mean, that's enough. It's not, I don't think it's a love affair with Apple. I mean, quite frankly, okay, they're supporting their marketplace. I mean, again, I, I saw the statistic the other day and it's awe-inspiring. So it's 110, okay, billion dollar buyback. $110 billion, which the $110 billion has a market cap bigger than 418 stocks okay, in the S&P 500, meaning that Apple's like just their buyback is bigger than 418 companies, which is, it's just, I mean, stupid at that point. Like, how can that be reasonable? You know, I remember when like years ago, Years ago, you would have stuff like Mark Cuban did. He would put a collar on his stock, right? Yeah. Which, which is buying puts on the stock that you basically own. And then Sarbanes Oxley happened, and you know some regulations. For those of you who don't know, Sarbanes Oxley was was basically like you know, you got to put your uh, yourself on the line. Uh, you better be telling the truth, or you're going to you know federal <clears throat> prison. Um, anyway. So they banned like a lot of that and a lot of those practices. And after they actually stopped, if you look, for those of you who have no idea what I'm talking about with Mark Cuban, okay, if you looked at what Mark Cuban did, he put a collar on. There's nothing wrong with that. By the way, I'm not ripping on Mark Cuban, at least not for that. Um, <laughs> I can think of 50 other things I could rip on him about, but I'm not ripping on Mark Cuban. Um, what Mark Cuban did is he put a collar on, right? So he goes out there against his stock and he buys puts, okay? And I'm getting somewhere with this and he sells calls to finance that. Now they right. banned that for insiders, okay? The moment that they banned that for insiders, stock buybacks a few years later became all the rage because if you can't protect yourself through definitive hedging technique, you can, in fact, okay, protect yourself by buying back your own stock. Now, there's no one's going to complain though, because the board are all going to be shareholders. The shareholders are shareholders and everybody's in on it, but it is in a sense, you know, it might not be the best utilization of $110 billion. The thing I think that gets me the most though, they have $110 billion. Now they have a lot more cash than that. Go to the company profile over here. They have like, you know, 58, you know, whatever net cash balance and so forth. They have huge amounts of cash flow. I just don't like when they're not throwing everything they have into R&D, like everything you got. When people are talking about, let's make it a green planet. Let's do this. Okay. Here's a company right here, right? That everybody that's green loves Apple. Okay. Forget the fact that they have children making your iPads. Forget that. Everybody loves Apple that's green. You realize that they have the capital. Okay, and the know-how to throw everything they have into R&D, making the world a green place, but it doesn't make a difference. They'd rather buy back their own stock. That's how I feel about Apple because I don't like the hypocrisy around it. They're mm. buying back their own stock to hedge themselves. There's nothing more. Everything else that you'd say is BS at that point because you know that's it is what it is. And I'm not, I, look, it's, it's everywhere, okay? Buybacks are really precarious to me, especially when you're trading all-time highs, really precarious. Uh, and you're very close to all-time highs in most of these stocks, okay? Tell me how you really feel. <laughs> Children making my iPhone, that just, it warms my heart, okay? Um, I think they actually have labor laws in place over there, but uh, anyway, con continuing on over there. Well, my, my take is I have nothing against buybacks as long as there's like three things in play. Number one, your stock has been like knocked down. So you've mitigated a lot of the risk. Number two, you're buying the stock back because, well, it's cheap. Apple's implying that buying their own shares makes the stock cheap here, which it's ridiculously expensive. And number three, they, like you said, they're deploying cash when they should be pouring into art. It's a poor use because if that stock tanks 30 bucks, you just wasted a way of hiring people or creating new products. So I'm just really down on buybacks at an all time high. It, the risk is too high and it's not an efficient use of cash. Um, go ahead. By the way, I love the uh, Kenman caught the, uh, I caught the office space reference. By the way, I use that reference all the time. 
my kids use that reference, which is really messed up. I've watched my, uh, my kids have actually watched the movie Office Space with me, which they don't really fully get it yet, but you know, I'm working on them. Okay. I'm definitely, uh, definitely working on them. So uh, I'm surprised there's not more comments about the, uh, like nobody thinks about this stuff with like the green thing and, you know, everything's green. We're destroying the environment. Okay. But they're buying back $110 billion with their own damn stock. Okay. But it's, but it's okay. Cause, cause they're green anyway, throwing that one out there. Okay. Um, so the buybacks are, you know, decisively to buy back shares, which actually they don't dilute the shareholders is the opposite. It actually increases, increases the, strength right, right. the strength of your shares. I mean, I remember like years and years ago, okay, where Microsoft, Microsoft is actually very big in share buybacks, but I remember years ago looking at this. Uh, this is, um, again, they split at times, but I remember this was like 8 billion and that was like 15 years ago. It was 8 billion, but they've, you know, subsequently, you know, there's splits that happen in here, yada, yada, yada. Um, and even after all of those splits, they've bought back a proverbial crap load of shares in there. Um, and it's so hard to see splits and crap like that. Anyway, the S&Ps right now are slipping, okay? Well, they're slipping. This is exactly what I was talking about this morning too, some slippage. By the way, in terms of stocks today, like I want your feeling on this one because I have a position in here and I heard Blake and Brandon uh, talking about it, but it's Goldman Sachs. I heard Blake and Brandon talking about it. I mean, look, I have a position here and it's bearish. It's already bearish. Like I did it already. Okay. So it already happened. Um, and I'm going to show the position because I always promise to like update trades. So now I need us back at like 435, but we have a $20 expected move. But damn, man, we went to like 460. Things got rocking in here. I look at expected move. We're going to bring up your technicals in just a second. This thing is cracked. Forget about the week that it had earnings. Cracked expected move once, twice. Third time's the charm and it just keeps going. It's insane. Okay, statistically like wild. What do you uh what might you want to look at on here? You gonna make me bring up an RSI? Yeah, you, you can bring up an RSI. You know, it, the, I, I'm gonna actually compliment you here because there are times when technicals just completely fail. And this is one of those times. It just comes down to when does the stock hit peak valuation? And you know, how far can the multiple expand? And a lot of people are betting on the multiple expanding because they're going to cut rates but the way, there's I no just... way the cut fed's going to cut rates unless the economy unless the market tanks a thousand points don so they're just buying hoping that even if there's not a multi, uh a rate cut that the it can expand that multiple to a certain level where it's not prohibitive that's my fundamental argument here by the way i wanted to show you like i have i still have the jeff b setup on my uh screen over oh, here oh goodness man that's it's old but you know <clears throat> if ever if ever we need to uh if ever we need to replace Jeff, don't worry, I got it. I got it. Speaking of which, if you haven't saved your studies, Jeff, save them because this weekend, this weekend, uh, Thinkorswim on the back end will be cleared into Chucky. And in doing so, they might uh, <clears throat> screw the proverbial ooch. <laughs> Sorry to be so literal, but uh, you know, it's, it's, it's plausible. By the way, I have my fonts all blown up, so this crap's hard to see. But take a look. This is obviously the sixth month. Take a look. RSI 77. You know, I know you got your little stochastic over here. That thing is so ridiculously. Uh, MACD hasn't rolled over, but, no. you know, your, your personal favorite, linear regression. Okay. We're a home, baby. This is least squares fit method, too. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. think i haven't think i haven't listened after like 20 years of listening to your crap <laughs> but <laughs> i uh i swear it's just your like osmosis in my ear over here um, I've, I've i've programmed you in a way that your wife can't oh believe me i am well-trained animal I'm <laughs> Yeah, you hiding in the shocked. mountains tells me you're not a really well-trained animal. I, you know what? Sadly, I like, you know, I love this house. Absolutely love it. This is the best built house I've ever owned. Love it up here in the mountains. I haven't been up here since December because the freaking house flooded in Arizona. I've been dealing with all that crap. Um, but I, uh, even she was like, you need to go bye-bye. <laughs> Get away <laughs> from me. You need to go bye-bye. Well, I was, you know, there was an insurance adjuster and, uh, I was uh, I was getting a little testy the other day when the insurance adjusters were back out, a little bit testy. 
Um, <clears throat> they haven't even demolished everything in the house yet. So uh, I started doing that by myself without hammers or anything. And she said, yeah, maybe you should go up to the mountains for a couple of days. That was a good idea. Okay. That Don was, Don was going to hurt himself. Um, <laughs> anyway, <laughs> I was banished to mountain home. Uh, kids are actually all bummed. They're like in school right now. So we're at the upper edge of that li like linear regression. I think any way you want to put it, Goldman Sachs is in like never, never land. And this one, I'm surprised because, and I'll tell you why I'm surprised. There's not usually big options order flow in here. Okay. And there isn't even now. So I, I can't point to options driving this thing. Okay. I, I don't know what to point to. Like, how the hell is this thing, you know, hitting highs, new highs, and all-time highs? It's, uh, I think that's pretty wild, you know? I think it's pretty wild over there. Uh, by the way, somebody was asking if you should save your desktop. Look, okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to spend a minute on this. Jeff, if you don't mind, we can we can go, go ahead. for a few more minutes, man. Are you, yeah, are you we, okay? He needs, yeah. we need to, he needs to hear this. Yeah, yeah functionality okay. is everything. Yeah. So on Thinkorswim, they're going to go through what is called clearing conversion this weekend. Now, I've been through a clearing conversion. I was think or swim when TD Ameritrade bought us. And when TD Ameritrade cleared us, it was absolutely horrible. TD Ameritrade botched the entire job. And the people from the think or swim group, the original people, we sat there and watched them botch the job. And then on clearing conversion day, all hell broke loose. And I don't know if anybody remembers that, but we had three days where Think or Swim, you guys didn't even know this, but Think or Swim had no back end for three days, meaning that there was a there was three plausible days where you could have traded and Think or Swim couldn't see, it knew your PL, but Think or Swim couldn't see the back end margin system. It was friggin' wild. And we did something because they were failing. I mean, there was actually an article that came out in the time too. There was an article during clearing conversion. Um where it said the Thinkorswim TD Ameritrade, I think it was Bloomberg that broke the news, the Thinkorswim TD Ameritrade clearing is a failure, okay? Um, because the, the product wasn't working. And at that point, the Thinkorswim group uh, took control, meaning that we, we actually ripped the entire project back from TD Ameritrade on the fly. And we had developers sitting there injecting code into a live trading application while the marketplace was open. It was, I'll never forget that, um, you know, cause I was, I was sitting in the room with them when this was going on. And by the way, changing code in a trading application while the market is going on and people are firing positions off, okay, isn't just dangerous. It's like, it's almost ludicrous, but there was no choice because somebody could have traded a hundred million dollars of securities and we would not have been able to see it. Um, yeah. That's not going to happen this weekend. What's going to happen this weekend is you're just going to pick stuff up and move. Okay. What I'm afraid is <clears throat> there's a kill switch that they'll have on here. Everybody learned from that experience. There's a kill switch. And if the clearing conversion doesn't go properly, my account is a portfolio margin account. The portfolio margin accounts are the biggest, most concerning accounts because the equations behind it are incredibly complex. You'd think rebuild, drop it over there, no problem. But their systems at Schwab have never handled accounts like this. Okay, So they're going to drop it in there. It's the portfolio margin accounts, which are their biggest accounts that are going to possibly see some issues. The other main issue is when you do clearing conversion, you're kind of on a different version of Thinkorswim. It looks and feels exactly the same, but it really is kind of a different version of Thinkorswim. And it's possible that you could lose, like, you know, my auto expected moves over here. It's possible we could lose our studies. So if you want to assure yourself that everything you have that's saved, like when you go to auto expected moves, see auto expected moves when I pull it up, you could actually go into here, click the little beaker, okay? You can then click on that scroll, and I'm going to highlight it right now for you guys. You can click right there on that scroll and copy and paste it into some construct, right? So I'll click and I'll copy and paste the actual code because that assures that it's going to work, okay? Now, how many studies do you have? Well, I have Quantix. I'm going to copy and paste that, auto-expected moves. It, like a year-to-date percentage, that's just a setting. That doesn't mean anything. 
you know, that, that, that doesn't mean squatting here, but there's, you know, there's styles. When you have styles like this, it's possible that you could lose some styles. Okay. It's possible like these drawings, drawings are saved. Okay. Both server side and locally. So you can actually, you know, save these things again and again and again, save as new drawing set, yada, yada, yada. Just understand and don't freak out. Like if you have a major code that you built, don't worry about if we built it. If we built it, we have the codes. But if you have a major code that you built, you might want to go in there just for argument's sake, double click on here and copy that crap right? And paste it into like, you know, a Word doc or something and save it. Because you could come in on, you will only know this Sunday night, because when they go into clearing conversion, they shut you down on a Friday afternoon, you won't be able to access your account again till Sunday night. Okay. Um, and, and that that's it. And, and they're probably prompting you that you might have a different username and password, yada, yada, yada. But hopefully everything looks okay. Now I know that some of you guys are saying, okay, I know you're saying like, oh no, Don, that's stupid. I'm just going to come up here and I'm going to go save, you know, the, the workspace. Okay. Well, no, what's stupid is that's exactly the file that will get cleared. So if they screw up, you could save the workspace all you want. That doesn't necessarily pertain, okay, that it's going to open up properly, you know, on the following, uh, the following days. It just, it doesn't necessarily save anything. Like the links that we use, when you come in here and you share studies, like these shared links, we have had problems with those since this clearing conversion started. We've had problems with our shared chart links. The one that I'm actually concerned about is right here. The SPX, I've been saving these expected moves, but the expected moves are a drawing set. This one I've got to think long and hard about because I'm not entirely sure that I can save them on my side. Like the drawing tools are the ones that uh, that are concerning me, okay? And the workspace that's saving your layout may not work. So again, let's hope for the best, but you got to plan for the worst. Uh, and there's a chance, like if the platform doesn't open up, okay, you know, you got, you got to be Johnny on the spot and be able to back yourself up, know what your positions are, be comfortable with your positions, especially coming into this weekend. Be comfortable with your positions. This is a nominal day for me, $700 of P&L. Be comfortable with your positions, know what they are. Um, you know, I wanted to just mention that nobody has to freak out, okay? If you lose some stuff, you lose some stuff. But make sure like the big the big stuff, if you've ever written any script, like if you needed Quantix again, don't worry. I got you, right? It's on my laptop. It's It's on my desktop, it's on my computer and on the island. Like I actually save the scripts because I'll work on the scripts. You know, it's actually really cool, Jeff. Uh, mm. I work on the scripts now with chat GPT. Okay. Thing talks dirty to me and I like it. <laughs> um, I uh, no, I really, I love, I love actually screwing around with chat GPT. It is amazing to me that it understands think script. I mean, it's just, it is amazing. Like think script came out of some guy's head, you know, in St. Petersburg, Russia. And like, I don't know, 20 something years ago. And and now a computer is able to program the way that he is. That just blows my mind, you know? And that's that's why I, I saved a Jeff Beerman setup on here too. Just just in case Jeff's not here on Monday, you know, don't worry, I, I got you, I yeah. got you. Um, so anyway, I, uh, I'm i gonna turn it over to you. I know you have a coaching session in here. Yeah. Anything else, uh, anything else uh, pre pressing issues in here? No, I'm just, I just think this is a waste of a day. I think there's too much, it's Friday. It's OPEX. It's a new high. It's performance chasing. Well, These are the days I hate. Before we get ahead of ourselves, I want to know why the XLF is freaking up. I mean, is it higher for longer? This is like, I, I this one bothers me like much more than tech. I get tech and tech is squirrely right now at best. But what really kind of brought this rally to where it is, the financials, man, have been ripping. They've been ripping. I caught the move in financials, I caught this move to the downside, but this rip, I didn't expect. Not only didn't I expect it, I almost faded it again. I did fade it in Goldman Sachs, but I am uh, I am a bit perturbed about the viciousness of some of the moves uh, this week. Financials have carried the week. And 
again, I don't, other than order flow, I, I can't give you a reason why in here. Throw my hands in the air. Yeah. Hmm. All right. We have uh, NVIDIA, okay? NVIDIA, which is actually pulled back to some uh, to some extent on the day. Thing was actually rocking. It's pulled back. I mean, look, to say that this is going to be a completely dead day, the bonds are actually basically at lows right now. Those bonds are down 21 ticks. There's some huge size in there too. Like I would say that that's, you know, for the most part kind of pivotal. But um, bonds are definitely rocking out there. If we're going to pull back, I don't know if we have it in us mm. to pull all the way back to uh, 5190. I mean, we're 30, no. 30, 35 handles away from it. Okay. Come on. We rallied 30 handles yesterday. What? You can't sell off 30 handles? You can't see. No, it. not with this type of my momentum set up on the four hour MACD. The answer is not like, not likely. Oh, no, man. Do the MACD people make you say that? Yeah, yeah, they actually did. And it looks like we're going to be up today, Monday and Tuesday before we run into gas. Oh, you're killing me. You're killing me, Smalls. That's well, not doing yeah. me any good either. But but next week also, you have to deal with, you know, I know we're looking out, okay? Yeah, does just, just your MACD, uh, you know, CCPI? Okay, by the way, that's not our CPI. Our CPI comes that, out when they, that, our that CPI? could be a Monday. game changer. Wednesday, 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 Wednesday. CPI. Yep. Yeah. Oh, come on. It's going to come out soft. I've already, I've already read the article that said it was going to come out soft. Uh, I just, not what yeah. I heard. Really? I No, I read that Goldman thinks it could be a, a game changer where it actually comes in much hotter than expected. Oh, uh -huh. interesting. Okay. I, uh, I'll like Goldman for today. Speaking of- uh, I, I, The market I'm obviously sure. doesn't think so. It doesn't pay any mind to it at all. Um, You know what? Here's an interesting argument. Maybe the rally is because it thinks CPI is going to come in a little soft. Yeah. Because, uh, do you see again that consumer sur sentiment survey was just, uh, was brutal? It's brutal. Assume it. That I, I just, I can't take seriously. I can't even say it. The consumer, the Michigan What's... consumer sentiment survey, like surveys are, it's just so wild. I don't know if you remember, but you know, you were at TD Ameritrade at the, at the time uh, that guy came up with uh, IMX. Yeah. Yeah. Son of a. Remember the IMX uh, reading about money man? Was it buying money flows? So the IMX is this. By the way, I'm, I'm, I'm going to tell a little history on this one. The IMX is a was a TD Ameritrade investor movement index. Okay, and there was actually an actuary that worked in the trader group uh, under Steve Quirk, like it was his uh, his main actuary guy which is, uh, he belonged to what we called the nerdery. Um, there was there was a group actually at TD Ameritrade, we called it the nerdery. And I worked a lot with the nerdery because that was the group that we could ask them any question. And I'm serious about this, like any question you could think of, like what does somebody do on order flow on this and this, you know, like how many people sell covered calls? You could ask them anything and they could come up with an answer for you. It took them a few days, but there was an entire, like, there was a statistics group. You know, there was actuaries in there. There was math geeks. There was PhDs and so forth. Okay. Let's just, like, let's call it what it was. Uh, a bunch of people that, uh, you know, were, uh, I almost said something really messed up, but I'm just going to let that one go. <laughs> insult our listeners. That's it. No, it wasn't going to insult the listeners. It's going to insult this group over here. Okay. okay. They, they were they were definitely not supposed to be for public consumption. Anyway, they came up specifically one guy. I think his name was Chris. Chris came up with an equation. It's like beta weighting portfolios because there used to be a TD Ameritrade sentiment survey and sentiment sucks, right? That was something that would like market makers and former traders will not listen to sentiment. Okay. It's the big you know, middle finger to sentiment because sentiment's so stupid. It's how dumb. do you feel about the market? Okay. But don't tell me how you feel. Show me. Okay. Show me. So the IMX, by the way, this, this guy heard that and he came up with this IMX thing. The IMX is an equation that looks at securities in the portfolio across a spectrum of TD Ameritrade clients. It's the full spectrum of TD Ameritrade clients, whether they're long, whether they're short, and it actually plots it. And if you look at this though, it's kind of shocking. Right, it's kind of shocking because it goes down. The only problem is, okay, and there is a problem with it now. Um, uh, they uh, apparently have given up 
on it. I, I don't know if they even produce it anymore, okay? Or if it's under a different symbol, I don't even know. Um, but this was, it's a great idea. Uh, and it's a great idea, and it, it stopped in 23. But it's a great idea because they were aggregating the full portfolio. Or maybe it's under a different symbol, I don't know, okay? Uh, I, I love what Zay just say, we got it. They didn't have girlfriends or boyfriends, okay? Yeah, they had a computer though, man. That's that's about it. Yeah, I really, Zay is said it in the most proper language, okay? That group, the nerdery, was not allowed to talk to other humans. <laughs> let's let's put it politely in that way, okay? They were out there, man. That was, that was a group that was out there. They like lock them up in the basement somewhere, definitely threw away the key. Hmm. Anyway. I, I actually miss this. I'm gonna have to dig in and see if they uh, if they change the symbol or something in here. Honestly, don't know. Okay, I don't know. Um, all right, continuing uh, continuing on. Listen, I'm gonna turn it over to you because I know you've got a coaching session today. What yeah, do you got on tap? I can, I can you, cut it in half. No big deal. What do you got on tap? I'll stay on with you another five minutes. I I uh, listen. Okay, uh, I don't have any kids yelling at me right now, and you know all I all I've got in front of me today is a guy to fix a refrigerator. Okay, that's that's it. Um, that reminds me of actually a Seinfeld quote. What are you running against? Common sense and a man in a wheelchair. Um, that's all I have in front of me today. Uh, anyway, the uh, do you not remember that one? I've okay. seen it. I've seen them all. Yeah, I know you've seen them all. Do you know which one that is though? No. Which... What are you running against? It's when uh, Kramer is actually going to. Uh, he's the uh, going for the head of the HOA of Del Boca Vista. Oh yes, yes. That's another one I think I by osmosis because I don't sit and watch the Seinfeld episodes, but I'll keep them on like in the background, like when I'll go to sleep, you know, and it uh, definitely, definitely his, leaks his, in. His right hand man was Morty. That's right. He was like a straw candidate. It he was, was a straw stuff. candidate. Exactly. It's not unlike what's going on right now for the presidential elections. Yeah. I'm still not convinced who's running coming up to this presidential election. I'm real. I'm honestly not. Uh, I'm not, not even joking about that. Okay. If I was, uh, you know, to place a bet, the two candidates that are up there right now, okay, one of them at least is, I think, is going to be out. I just, I, it's, it's going to be, that is going to be some volatility, you know, maybe this summer to see if they find a, uh, a replacement. To, and again, um, the, um, I watch odds on this, by the way, you're not supposed to be able to bet in the United States and political candidacy, but you can definitely over in Europe. And I actually uh, keep an eye on some of that. And I find it pretty fascinating because it's like survey, like sentiment surveys versus looking at like, I like that there's political betting over there. I really do. I like it because it really gives you a better feel than like, you know, people listen to polls and so forth. Polls are basically surveys. Right. So look at the political betting uh, because there's still tens of millions of dollars on it. Um, it's going to be, much more interesting than people uh, kind of give it credit for. And that is also, there's so many people, I know you're not a Jerome Powell fan. Oh. Okay? And this, but there's, there's a political aspect in there where Jerome Powell was not the current administration's boy. Okay. He was the previous administration. The previous administration didn't get along with him. He's not getting along. Like, like I just, I don't buy the thing. He must cut rates before the election. That's not going to save a damn thing at this point. Like, but again, I, I have problems with that because if anything, Powell seems it's pretty apolitical, at least, you know, other than Janet Yellen probably has his ear. Okay. Um, oops. I'm going to have to run off right now because I've actually got a guy that's, uh, that's actually here at the house. So I'm going to stop and turn it over to you. Uh, almost immediately. So uh, bear with me here for just a second and I'll turn it over to Jeff Beerman.